our speakers today. I'm going to start with Hannah Palmquist. Hannah is a graduate of Emory University who grew up in Becker, Minnesota, and knew from a fairly young age she wanted to be a prosecutor. And Hannah went on to become exactly that. She also went on to become the assistant DA in both DeKalb and Cobb counties, and in 2018, Hannah became the supervisor of the Cobb County Juvenile Unit, working with runaways and victims of human trafficking. In 2019, Georgia's Attorney General, Chris Carr, tapped Hannah to become the head of the newly created Human Trafficking Prosecution Unit. So we will hear from Hannah shortly. But joining her will be our First Lady, Marty Kemp. I have gotten to know the First Lady through my service on her Grace Commission. And I know two of the most important things to our First Lady are one, being a mom, to three amazing daughters, and two, being the wife and partner to our governor, Brian Kemp. I don't know how you've done all the traveling you've done lately, but we are so appreciative of you joining us here today. You're coming before your husband, by the way. <laughs> she is a proud and fiercely loyal graduate of UGA and started her career at her family's travel agency before joining Governor Kemp's development and construction company. In addition to her work to end human trafficking, First Lady Kemp is also committed to supporting Georgia agriculture and the Georgia Grown program, promoting literacy and mental health, and advancing foster care and adoption reform initiatives. She is a busy lady but is very passionate about the topic you're about to hear about and will be interviewed today by our very own fellow Rotarian and CEO of Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, Donna Highland. So please join us on the stage. Thank you both for being here and thank you for the extraordinary work that you do. It's amazing. You know, at Children's, we see these kids and when they're rescued and it's, there's probably not many things more heartbreaking than to see what's happened to these kids. So thanks so much to both of you. Um, so Marty, tell us, how did you get involved in human trafficking and tell us a little bit about the Grace Commission. It was an honor to be here today, thank you. I did not know I was beating my husband, so I'm glad I don't have to follow behind him because that is a hard thing to do. But um, I, we learned about uh, human trafficking when we went, when Brian was not even sworn into office in January of 2019. And the girls, we had three daughters, um, and so they're now 24, 22, and about to be 21. And we went up to the Atlantic Station, had a press conference on stop traffic, and it had 72 school buses, which represented the 3,600 kids that are taken in to trafficking a year just in Georgia. And I was just, you know, blown away. We, you know, campaigned for two and a half years around the state and never heard of anything about it. And I understand when I learned about it um, that I said I wanted it to be one of my initiatives that, you know, that we needed to talk about it. And it's an evil industry, and I understand why people don't want to talk about it, but I was going to do that. And so we formed the Grace Commission just to bring, and it stands for Georgians for Refuge, Action, Compassion, and Education. And just brought all the experts to the table because we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We just needed to, to know what was going on, learn more about it, and then just to see what we needed to do about it. So that's how that was formed. Well, and you and Governor Kemp did something very special. You created the first ever Georgia Human Trafficking Prosecution Unit. Um, and so tell us about that unit and why was it necessary? This is for you. Oh, and then we're going to go to oh, Hannah. Okay. <laughs> then we'll go to Hannah. You created well, <laughs> it, and then we'll let the... Well, you know, we're, we're huge uh, supporters of law enforcement. And when Brian was running... He talked a lot about crime and the gang problem that we had, and several people laughed, laughed at him, and then now you're seeing on the news about every day the problems that we have. So it was very important to fund this position so that they could you know, definitely have the, the resources that they needed, the tools that they needed to go after these terrible individuals. So that was a priority from before he was elected. So Hannah. You fight the bad guys. 
the really bad guys. Tell us a little bit about your unit. So our unit, when it was first created, was six positions. We have investigators, analysts, we have a victim advocate dedicated to helping the children that we recover. And we're very grateful because every year it's grown since. Um, we've been continually made a priority. So now we are a dozen people. So in a matter of a few years, we've grown from six to a dozen. So every day we go out, we look for missing kids, we recover children, and we prosecute the people who buy and sell them. So I think, you know, for this is such a horrible topic, I think, for almost everybody. Hannah, could you educate all of us about who the victims are and what often makes them vulnerable to the, the buyers, just that whole grooming process for the victims, um, and then I wish you'd talk a little bit about the perpetrators because it takes both sellers and buyers. The victims are really anyone. And when we talk about what makes a child or even an adult sometimes susceptible to being trafficked, it is any unmet need. So most of our children are actually in the foster care system. So a child who may be lonely, may have unstable housing, may be moved from place to place. What a trafficker knows how to do is how to manipulate. These are not kids who are being snatched from the park and sold into human trafficking because if you go snatch a child from a park, what's going to happen? Somebody's going to call 911. There's going to be an Amber Alert. Instead, it's those kids who have some unmet need of love or attention and the traffickers will reach out to them and pretend to fill that need. They'll say, I'll be your boyfriend. Let's get married. I'll give you an apartment. They'll pretend to love them and care for them. That's the grooming process and that's how they lure them into being trafficked. And then the buyers, they're really, they're anybody. Um, sometimes they're married. Sometimes they have children. Sometimes we even see that they have children around the same age as the people that they're purchasing for sex. So I think it's important to know the buyers are anyone and it's really happening everywhere in our state. How do they find the victims to purchase? Online advertisements. So it's a lot easier to find than you would think. So you think it's something secretive, you think it's this underworld or the dark web, it's not. If you go on a mainstream dating application, they don't expressly say it, but when you look at an advertisement, it's easy to understand what it is. It's often phrased as something like an escort advertisement. And then what traffickers will do that buyers, the experienced ones, understand is they will always post that the person is above the age of 18 so that the company running the website doesn't shut it down. So it'll look like an escort advertisement for someone who is 19, 20, 21, but oftentimes that is in fact a child. And the buyer will then respond to the advertisement and they'll meet up. So when you prosecute, do you prosecute the, how do you prosecute the buyers and the purchasers? That's something we focus a lot on. So historically, sellers were getting prosecuted and buyers weren't because it's harder to discover. They're, um, in the child's life for a very short amount of time and they leave less evidence. So one of the things that we really focused on when we started the unit is how are we gonna get these guys? How are we gonna get buyers? And I'm happy to say that now the majority of the people we prosecute are buyers. So we've um, sent 18 traffickers to prison this year, so since January um, 1st, and most of those were buyers. And Isn't that great? And Marty, I think I remember you saying that that's one of the greatest deterrents for buyers is their fear of being caught. And not only if they get caught, now they're being prosecuted. And it's my understanding it's now on your permanent record. Absolutely. And that's something you've done under Governor Kemp's administration. So we passed eight pieces of legislation that, have, that not, not only have helped the victims and we had them be a part of, you know, uh, writing up that legislation and not only being able to help them, but also to have harsher penalties and give them more tools 
to be able to prosecute. And, that, and I will give the, the legislature a, a shout out because they have passed all these this pieces of legislation unanimously, all but one voted against it, but I think it was just a little misunderstanding about what the, um, surely of what the- But you will never forgive the, that no. person. <laughs> <laughs> but it is um, with large support by the, um, by the legislatures and I really applaud them for being very active and um, passing that legis important legislation that has helped. So Hannah, what's the hardest part about getting a conviction? These cases are tough. Um, they're tougher to prosecute than your ordinary cases, which I think speaks to why the unit needed to be created in the first place. We don't have cooperative witnesses or cooperative victims. If you think about it, if somebody goes and robs a gas station, the gas station clerk's gonna tell police what happened. He's gonna pick them out of a photo lineup. All the witnesses there, they have nothing to hide. So they're gonna point at the guy. But when you have human trafficking, you have a victim who's been brainwashed, manipulated, um, may believe that she's in love with her trafficker, has been taught to distrust law enforcement, maybe believes that she'll be in trouble for her participation. And then when this event takes place at some seedy motel surrounded by other criminal activity, nobody wants to step forward and tell you what happened. So the greatest struggle is you don't have cooperative witnesses who will take the stand and tell the truth to the jury about what happened. So tell us about some of your convictions and the rescues that you've been able to be part of and that you've led actually. So 18 so far this year, um, one recent that we're particularly proud of, and it th it's thanks to the 2019 statute, one of the many they passed in 2019 that increased the penalties. Um, I had a man plead guilty to a life sentence, um, and that wasn't even a trial. It was He pled guilty to a life sentence without the victim even having to testify. Um, he had trafficked her in Fulton and Cherokee County. Um, and so he pled guilty in Fulton County and then we brought him up to Cherokee to plead to a life sentence there, just for the principle of it. Um, so we're particularly proud of that one. We're getting really strong sentences. Um, historically, it's been difficult to get judges to send buyers to prison because oftentimes, because the ads post the person as over 18, it's difficult to get a judge to say this person should go to prison. Um, but recently in Cherokee County, I did get a buyer um, a prison sentence of 10 years and another one a prison sentence of 12 years, followed by um, decades of probation. And then these people will all, it's mandatory sex offender registry. Anytime that someone's convicted um, of human trafficking, it's mandatory sex offender registry. So I'm happy to say in Georgia, you know, thanks to all of these changes, we have phenomenal statutes on the books for human trafficking. We really do. And that's changed a lot under your administration, under your and Brian's administration. So thank you. Thank you. What kind? What are the ages? We see a lot of teenagers. So when we are prosecuting these cases, oftentimes our victims are teenagers, but what we see when we look in their history is that oftentimes it looks like they were being trafficked for a very long period of time before it ever came to someone's attention. Um, the most horrific instances I've seen are when you look in a child's history and there's indications that one of their own parents may have been selling them in their childhood, and that's how they were groomed um, into this life. So teenagers, by the time we're prosecuting them, um, but we're trying to look at how do we intervene more quickly so it doesn't get to that point. Oh, can I add something Absolutely. to that, sorry? I was received an email a couple of weeks ago asking for help for a, um, an aunt that had adopted a, her niece because the uh, parents, both the parents had trafficked the, their daughter <clears throat> excuse me, and the school teacher was helping. And it was just stories like that that I hear that are just, it, people just don't even have any idea how, how really bad it is. So I've, I feel like that talking about it has helped tremendously and just having people come up and tell me their stories is really, really hard. But I just feel like if, that luckily they feel like they have a they can talk about it or they have somebody to go to. And that was my goal of all of this was just to make sure that the perpetrators knew that we, they had to look over their back in Georgia because we're not tolerating this evil industry here. 
and then just to have educate. And I love going to Rotaries because I've been to several around the state and they're so engaged. They turn their chairs around, they listen. And the best one was, was one of the ones in Noonan and we just had a really big bust in Noonan. So it's making a difference, I feel, I hope. Marty, I still remember the first grace. Yes. The first Grace Commission meeting when you had a young lady speak who was in her 20s, but her father had trafficked her when she was 12. And her story, I mean, I was sobbing. I, yeah. It was almost uncontrollable because when you heard the fact that the person that she should trust the most in her life had trafficked her, it was, it was just overwhelming to and think And her dad's about. still a preacher. It's horrible. It's horrible. Horrible. So I think those are, we all have to be alert to this. Um, one of the things that I know you've also done this last year is um, pass some legislation about um, the, in the gas stations, putting up signage. Talk a little bit about that. I know that was one of our planned questions, but I think yeah. that's so important. Either okay. one of you, either one of you, because that, you know, identification for all of us, I know Delta, I don't know if there's anybody in the room for Delta, but Delta has done an amazing job of training all their flight attendants of what to look for and what to look for in these children that are being trafficked. And you've identified places where kids that are being trafficked are being taken and how to help them get help. Well, there's a lot of, it was interesting, a lot of information that is not that is that is on the laws on the books, but is not, you know, businesses are not participating, and so we just made sure that the the fine was a little stiffer, to make sure that they post this information so that you know it's just another education piece, and I'll let you speak uh, to more of that. But I have a friend that travels the state, and she goes by rest areas, and she'll you know let me know she's like it's not posted in here, and it's supposed to be posted you know, a hotline or something that when they go in the restrooms by themselves, obviously, they can get the number. Well, some of the rest areas were posting them like right when you walk in the door. Well, I mean, how are they going to take a picture of that when their perpetrator is right behind? So it's just the little things that we've learned around the state just to make those differences, especially about the, the foster care parents. There's a, there was a loophole that they were not to be, um, I remember being in Savannah our first year and I had a detective come up and he's like, I need to talk to you. There's a loophole. I can't try this case in South Georgia because, you know, the foster parents are protected. And I remember getting in the car and going, Brian, well, that cannot be true. And he goes, well, just find out more information. We literally had a, you know, conference call that Monday. And I was like, there's just no way that, that that was real. And it was. And so that was another piece of legislation that we got passed. So I'm sorry to let you know. So Rotary, you know, Rotary International has taken on this issue of human trafficking, and we have the World Cup coming to Atlanta in, um, in a couple of years. So talk, and we know that big sport, especially big international sporting events, are just a boom for this horrible industry. What does the business community here, you have a lot of influencers and influential people in this room, what do we need to do? Education, um, no matter what sort of business you're in, the, the people who work with you, work for you, they may see human trafficking and they may have an opportunity to observe it and to report it. So no matter what field it's in, we see it all the time, especially in the hotel industry. Employees are really in a position to be able to notice something and to call the police. So education is what we'd ask from the business community. Well, thank you again both. I think we have some time. We wanted to make sure we left some time for Q&A. Katie. I'm Johnny on the spot. Well, no, actually, John will be Johnny on the spot, but I'll. <laughs> I'll Thank you. Yes, I was going to mention that. Susan Norris wrote a book, and she has Rescuing Hope, a nonprofit, and she's also on the Grace Commission. And she wrote a book called um, Rescuing Hope. And, it, and I read it. I made Brian read it. It's a very difficult read, but it will help you understand how these individuals get into this 
life, and it was actually taken, she put it to one character, but it's true stories that happened to young girls in the Atlanta area and in the state of Georgia. So it is a very, and if you need a copy of it, just let me know and I'm happy to get you one. But the another part of, you know, that the victims needing help. So when they get rescued, they had nowhere to go. And so we have, are fixing to open our second receiving center. So it lets them come in, get the wraparound services that they need and education. I mean, they've missed their, really their childhood. So that, that has been, and, I, and my goal is at the end of this administration is to have a home or a receiving center in every, you know, any region of, in all the regions of Georgia that need it. One of the things before we go to Rod for the next question that I want to make the audience aware of, um, and this is happening nationally, is that victims are getting younger and younger and younger though, um, babies. And I know that in one of the uh, operations um, where there were some young women rescued, you had a three-month-old, right? They can certainly be all of ages. And a lot of times these crimes intersect with other crimes such as child molestation and other, other sex offenses. So there really isn't a limit to these crimes. Social media is huge. The question is around social media and how it's used by the, um, by the pimps oftentimes to perpetrate and groom and cultivate their victims. We haven't had a single case in four years that hasn't involved social media in some form. So most of the time, this is the way that kids are being recruited. And when, when parents ask, what can I do? The example I always give them is, would you leave your front door unlocked and just let anybody come in and out of your house talking to your child and interacting with your child and not monitor that? And they say, of course not. And I say, but when you hand them a phone or a laptop, that's exactly what you're doing. Your child can speak to anyone in the world when they have internet access. And a lot of people mistakenly think, oh, I'll block this website or that website because surely we're talking about the dark web or some very specific niche website. No, we're talking about Facebook, we're talking about Snapchat, Instagram. Um, that's how a lot of kids are recruited. So really monitoring that online activity, but also just making sure that every child's needs are met. Because if a child is secure and loved and stable in the home, that is not as much of a draw to them when they receive that attention. I had a question in the back and then Bill. There seems to be a tension between adoption and foster care and orphanages. And it seems as if the government has gone to the, uh, to the side more of foster care and of returning the child to their natural parents rather than orphanage uh, ways of dealing with Rather than to move them to orphanages. Would you speak to that? 
So we see kids from group home settings. Um, we see them coming in and out of foster care. We see them um, in their home environments. What I can speak to from my personal experience on our caseload is that of all of the many dozens of cases that I've prosecuted, I only had one victim who was victimized out of her home with, with a family present. Um, every other victim had been passed from home to home um, in the foster care system. So that's what I can speak to in the, in the context of this is that any time um, stability isn't present, that's when children become vulnerable. And our new, um, uh, the state, the new DFACS uh, director is Candace Broach, who actually created the Grace Commission with me. And she is, you know, very, very familiar with all of this. But also, you know, I know it's when, they, when the circumstance is better for them to go back to the family, but if it's not, then, I mean, certainly we are very supportive of adoption in the process, and I'm wanting to work more on that as well. And, and that was part of the legislation for foster care parents that we closed that loophole and, you know, held them accountable as well. Bill? Yeah, well, Dr. Stephen Messner. Say, we have Dr. Yeah, Stephen Dr. Mes Stephen Messner is sitting up, right Stephen? there, um, and he has a whole team, and this is what they do. And so the kids, um, they have very comprehensive programs, all types of different services in our Stephanie V. Blank Center for Happy and Healthy Children. Um, intentionally named that um, to try to help kids see there's hope for them. And Dr. Messner, there's, I mean, they just have a wide variety of, of team. They have, um, I mean, the stories, we have a facility dog. We have like 26 dogs that comfort people, but that dog and the stories of these kids that have been trafficked, you can imagine how distant they are, how they don't trust anybody. And the stories of them coming in and having people love them and care for them and show them there's a way and that they have hope and then connecting with the centers that, that uh, Marty's talking about. I mean, there are, there are teams of people, thank goodness, that spend their life and their training on rescuing these kids and making sure that, that, they, have, um, that they have a future and they have some amazing stories, thank goodness, um, in that program. So thank you to Dr. Messner and his team for what they do every day because it is a really hard job. So without demand, though, we wouldn't have this issue. So as much as we want to also work with the victims, what's being done to help with the buy side? Um, and how can Rotarians really lean into that aspect of it? Because if we can eliminate the demand, That's right. we eliminate the problem. So fortunately in 2019, under one of the legislative pieces that our First Lady championed, buying is the same as selling. The same um, sentence can be received now in the state of Georgia for somebody who buys a child versus someone who sells a child. I also think, circling back to that education piece, education can be a fantastic deterrent when it comes to buying. So y'all recall we mentioned earlier a lot of times People may not know that they're buying a child for sex. It may be a 15, 16, 17-year-old who appears as older and was advertised to be older. Under our statutes in the state of Georgia, that's not a defense. Lack of knowledge of age is not a defense. And the story we get time after time when we arrest these guys is they think it's a defense to say, well, I didn't know, I thought that she was 18. So educating people who would solicit these acts over the internet that if she turns out to be under 18, it's not a misdemeanor. Tra human trafficking, and that's on you. David Lewis will be our last question. Uh, well, you sort of asked part of my question, Seth, because let me ask the other part of it, which is, um, what would you like to see companies do 
And how can they find the training as well? So the, if you go on the web, the governor's website, there is a 30-minute training that is very educational of what to look for, and I would challenge your employees. I mean, we created that, and Brian um, didn't require it or mandate it, but he just encouraged all the agencies in the state to take that. And so I mean, you've got 85,000 employees. And so now a lot of the agencies in the state in state government require it, and that is part of their training. I know we have a lot of law enforcement, we're working on a law enforcement training as well, so they'll know what to look for. And it's in your everyday life that you may see something and call 911 and just have that gut feeling if you're at you know Publix or you're shopping or wherever and you see these, it just teaches you what to look for. And if you're wrong, that's fine, but I mean, can you imagine saving somebody's life? I mean, it, it would be unbelievable. So. I would encourage everyone in here to take the training and, and encourage your employees to take it as well. Well, please join me in thanking Hannah Palmquist and First Lady Marty Kemp and Donna Highland. Thank you.